don't like what I think I've become. Even the success of my own books has made me part of the very system which is an intellectual rape of the black peoples. This sense of outrage that's the stuff which makes people write. Too many of my friends died in the war. While I was um, busy studying, most of my own friends were also, as it were, were fighting in the bush. Um, they are the creators of today's Zimbabwe, and I think that um, the new black writers, the new Zimbabwean writers, among whom I unfortunately number, um, um, must articulate that outrage within what, whatever context um, uh, they can, or they want to, or whatever, I don't know, Christ. I'm sort of glad that I'll be seeing them again. I'm seeing my sisters and my brothers. I'm seeing my mother again. I've had no uh, contact with them all the time I've been in this country. But I don't really know how they've survived this struggle down there. Few of my generation have survived uh, Ian Smith's rule. Um, few of them are, are even alive enough to appreciate the fact that uh, what we, the outrage we felt when we were under Ian Smith has now actually resolved itself into um, uh, the independent Zimbabwe. London in the winter of 81. I was talking to Dambutso Marachera, who had been living in exile in England for eight years. I had sought him out because I wanted to film an extraordinary story he'd written about growing up black in white Rhodesia. The story is called The House of Hunger. The kind of hunger on which my country taught me and gave me, at least radicalized me in a, in a way which um, actually um, made myself. And uh, people in my country look forward to changing things. In other words, it made me at least see the possibility of actually um, uh, constructing something out of that hunger. Part of the hunger which Britain gives to African exiles, that kind of hunger actually has got no remote chance of ever, ever being satisfied in any way, whatever. Marachera had come to England on a scholarship to Oxford, but he couldn't collude easily with the colonizers' culture. In his second year, he left, having tried to burn down his college. He lived rough in the streets of London and wrote The House of Hunger. It won the Guardian Fiction Prize, but he found the awards dinner patronizing and hurled plates at the guests. He was banned from his publisher's office after a fight over royalties. He was imprisoned several times for drunkenness, damaging property, causing an affray. When I met him, he'd found a squat in central London and published a second novel, but he was alienated and alone and planning to return home. You see, I can put it to you, home, home, you mentioned the word home to me, it means nothing. Uh, I, 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 I'm even the most m mundane, ordinary human relationships, which most people take for granted, I've never really had them. I, uh, in that sense, actually, I can be accused of misanthropy, because frankly, um, um, I've seen how tenuous human relationships are because they always never depend on who is there and who is not but actual existing laws um, which um, within which humans um, well that word relate and um, that's why for instance in the house of hunger there is a total dislocation of um, 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 any sort of contact um, the only time people actually meet is um, uh, when they are brutalizing each other. 
starting my fiction is also an attempt to reorder my surroundings in such a way that the brutality underneath has some sort of shimmer which can make it humane. I think in terms of language, England beat me because I'm still using the English language. You, you can even listen to my voice and hear some of the Oxford sort of influences. Even my own voice is no longer my own. It's like a madman trying to shield his own madness beneath, uh, as it were, an acquired roof um, in some uh, weird hotel where he doesn't really know what's going on. That's one thing I hope to leave behind in England. That sense of always being on the brink of an illusion. When they were putting me in Pentonville prison, um, and um, you, you know when they're registering you, um, um, among one of the questions they ask you is, uh, who is your next of kin? I simply said, there's nobody. In this country, there's nobody. Um, and said, what? You mean, there's nobody out there? I mean, if anything happens to you, um, you mean there's nobody we can tell out there? That's when I said, well, you can tell my publishers. I said, oh, um, your publishers, who are they? And I gave them my publisher's name, that, well, if anything happens to me, as you say, then my publishers are my next of kin. <laughs> um, inform them. I hope, um, imagine being buried somewhere um, uh, by Heinemann's good God. I don't like what, um, what I've become. I don't want to talk about wearing my skeleton on the outside. I'd like to show my flesh for once. And if Zimbabweans are my flesh and my people, that's what I'm, I'm trying to get back to. That's also why I hope Zimbabwe will be good for me because I'm hoping that the experience of it for me will, as it were, illuminate that light within me which this country has blown out. So we left him a little anxiously in London and went on ahead to Zimbabwe. He was to follow later, but first we were going back through his writing to the roots of his fight with colonialism, back into the past of the House of Hunger. Jameson Avenue around Rhodes' statue to watch the parade of Rhodesia's fighting forces on land and in the air. The motorcycle escort of the BSAP leads the way. Cecil John Rhodes gazes down on the Army's motorized units. Rhodesian Combined Services were host to the South African Defence Force in a match watched by the President, the Honourable Clifford DuPont. Rhodesian Combined Services stormed through to a great win by 18 points to 9. But the score wasn't really important. What matters is that rugby promotes friendly relations and good neighbourliness. The Aloe, Cactus and Succulent Society of Rhodesia held its first ever show in July at the Garden Club Hall in Salisbury. Mrs. DuPont, wife of the President, opened the show which had a total attendance of 2,000 people over the two days. The prize for the best exhibit of the show went to Captain Alan Weeks from Hatfield in Salisbury. 
few hundred guests watched as members of the Rhodesian forces were decorated for gallantry, leadership, and devotion to duty in action. Soldiers and airmen received the Bronze Cross of Rhodesia. Reservists were presented with the Meritorious Conduct Medal. A crowd of more than 20,000 packed into Salisbury's police ground for the star-studded Forces 73 show in aid of the Terrorist Victims Relief Fund and Army, Air Force and Police Welfare. 13-year-old South African Gwyneth Ashley Robin endeared herself to everyone. <laughs> then the rain came, but it didn't stop her singing. spirit of the old tradition, the show goes on, symbolizing Rhodesia's spirit as she continues to overcome the challenges of the 70s. And so to the annual Independence Ball on the eve of Independence Day traditionally attended by the Prime Minister, Mr. Ian Smith, and Mrs. Janet Smith. On the stroke of midnight, the Prime Minister rings the independence bell. You may know or you may not know the words which are written on this bell of ours. There are the words inscribed, <clears throat> I toll for civilization, for freedom, for Christianity. There are flies squashed to their memory. An iron net had been thrown over the skies, quietly, and beneath it our minds festered. We were whores, eaten to the core by the syphilis of the white man's coming, screaming abuse at a solitary but defiant racist, bearing our ass to the yawning pit latrine, writing angry black poetry. Ah, heroes. Black heroes. I remember coming home one day. I was nine years old and on heat with living. When I was at school, when I was coming here, he let me ride. Oh, sir, tell me what you're going to do. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? I'm not talking English. Iwe, Iwe, what's up? Where are you going? What's up? Where are you going? What are you going to do? Thank <laughs> you. 
Kubara buku. Ndango muti chete kwa urukuta ureko nechimu nguku andiri. Ago ndishatiri kwa mwanoinyo. Zasina fani kwa kuita mwana mdika kadara. Ago ndishatiri kwa. Ago uramba kandi tarisa kutinde. Eni ya hatu mbo nizu kwa kana padiki diki pese mwanaiku. Aini andineta. Eh. Buku nyowa ni nyowa ni ria ramaka mtengi raiza ita ria. Varu 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 varu. Ina andinzu kwa mwanoinyo. Hatu mbo nizu kwa kana padiki diki pese shapu. Na saa ndi chila mwe msika ndi kwa ya kutikana ndi kafunga. Zino ndi shami sa mwana mdika kada ya kundi chila msika ndi kwa ya kada. Kuni vara mbuku maziso mbuku ija ija na kada ya. Ramaka tinga msunu. Ha? The skeletons of my childhood the lives of small men are like spiders' webs. They are studded with minute skeletons of greatness. And the house of hunger clung firmly to its own. The skeletons in its web still had sparks of life in their bones, alive in the stench of our decaying family life, with its headaches of gut rot and soul sickness. You won't find anything there. What is she? Sell that shit. Mari, Mari. Ndakape ya Mari Jinji kutuende ku university. Asibasa ndere kungo sikuera uchiwele nda chete. Sii usinga tuwa gebasa. Uza Ian Smith is a bloody white shit. Asiwe. Wakari le gera basara uticha. Ha? Sii mchida kuzipinza my trouble. Trouble? Shit. Waka pfura wano 13 vana. Peter kept talking about the bloody whites. The phrase seemed to be roasting his mind. And because he hungered for the fight, everyone saw it in his eyes and liked him for it. But the shell of the sky cracked. It was immaculate he fought. And as he beat her, those eyes stung him to a greater fury. It was me she turned to, yet I clung desperately to a tiny straw of loathing for her. up my grandfather. They said you were helping with the fighters. It's dead out there. Where's Peter? Out. Why did you come back? He's mad. You know nothing. What did I know?
Immaculate, are you all right? Did I know anything? Why did you come back? Did he hit you? Mm -mm. And you? I'll be all right. Why did you come back? I wanted to see you. trying not to think about where I was going. I didn't feel bitter. But I couldn't stay on in that house of hunger where every morsel of sanity was snatched from you. It's finished. It's finished. <laughs> Immaculate always talked like that, as if I was someone she had dreamed up. I wanted to see you. She made me want to dream, made me believe in visions, in hope. How could she have been conceived in the squalor of our history? How could she have a brother like Harry? I wanted to laugh at the cruel sarcasm that rules our lives. Nothing. It was a It was a bad shit. 
<laughs> that was Marlon Brando. That was Steve McQueen. He's got style, man. Huh? I like his style. You know? Huh? Yeah, just like James Bond in Doctor No. Oh, Clint Eastwood in that movie. What of that? Um, yeah. Marlon Brando. Yeah. I felt I was reviewing all the details of the shit my life had been, and was even at that moment. You should smoke those things, you know. Try one of these. Later. Oh, I have the packet anyway. I've got another. Now tell me, how's she? Who? My sister. Okay. Not for matter here. Seems Peter has not been treating her too well. Gossip. No, she told me herself. What about? You and her. What could she say about me? She's my brother's woman. <laughs> Your brother's woman, eh? Look, let's go and talk outside. We came out together, like Jesus and Judas, knowing each other's secret. Me and you, we're civilized. Yeah, civilized. Harry. 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 Civilized. For Harry, the word meant success, bought by selling us out. Harry, the police spy. Harry and I grew up together. He should have been something from the past, but he was always around. He was always there. Hey, Shakespeare! Come with us, man. Get in. What's the matter with you? Come for a ride. Where are you going? I I'm going home. No, man. Come with us. Stop the car. Mind the jacket, man. And he said, he said, where's the stuff, man? <laughs> he looked sick. He looked sick. When I just looked back at him and I said, God, he must be mad. There he was, standing like that. Huh? <laughs> oh, what people do for money. Gosh, it's unbelievable. Anyway, he got his mess that day. I fixed him, I fixed him. I fixed him, that's what he wanted. <laughs> oh, boy. Salisbury, 
The Rhodesian security forces have completed a successful mopping up operation in the Zambezi Valley. 11 terrorists have been killed, making a total of 24 killed this month. Meanwhile, the yeah, Ministry of Law yeah. and Order has announced increased rewards for information leading to the capture of terrorists and their sympathizers. Okay, finally, pull over there, man. The boys on the border have suffered a loss. Shavely, Sharon Labouchain, Tali's former aloe queen, and last year's was swinging the key. Here we go. Will no longer be walking the Come on, man. Come on. No harm is one by Stan Moss, a businessman who's a businessman. Hi, Charlie. Nice catch, Charlie. You're back again. <laughs> New jacket. Look, I want a full front of this time, not just my pretty face. Oh, meet my friend, Mr. William Shakespeare. Magadi. Over in Jono. Can I have a chocho, please? To a jolly picture, there's no kilometer picture, Kanaka, Kwan. I'm going to tell you, Kanaka. Yeah, I'm going to tell That's it. Did you get the shoes in? The shoes, man. Harry must have made a lot of photographers rich. The shit of reality, bleached out by floodlights. That's me, man, me, in the city. See you later. Hey, like I said, we are civilized, me and you. That's what we are, civilized. Sit down. There are no chairs, man. I don't want to mess up my jacket, I'm going to see a chick later. Hi, Harry. Hi. I think. Fine. I've got something for you. Mm. Okay. Look, I'll see you later. Eh? I'm talking to Shakespeare here. Shakespeare? Him? White chick. Guess. A white chick. What else, man? What else is there? What else is there? What else? I've been taught the whole history of Europe, and I've never left this place. I've got all this literature in my head. Tell me I'm in Africa. Tell me where I am. You should know. <laughs> You fool. What else? Suicide? That's for educated lunatics like you. Hey, Kanjan. Come with us. Come with us. Julia. Edmund. No, no. Another time. Okay. Check one. They had chosen. For them it was clear they could fight the enemy by joining the struggle. Why couldn't I? Wasn't that Edmund? You tell me what else? My white cheek is full of sugar. She's a full-bodied wine with a touch of divinity. That's what she is. How did you meet her? At the Christmas party, man, that's where. And man, has she got it. Got what? Everything. She's got everything nigger girls don't have. You see, nigger girls are just meat. And I don't like my meat raw. 
of course it's something else when a man is starving for pussy. <laughs> Shit. That's it, man. Sway it out of your system. It does a man good to sway. Cheers. I'll get you another. of hunger had become my mind and I didn't like the way the roof was rattling. The foul breath of our history fanned the heat of our thirst. All the black youth was thirsty. The freedom we craved was so alive in our breath that we became drunk before we had found it. Let's go inside and drink the good Lord's health. If it sticks, I might as well go down in style. What? I said you've got style, Harry. Style? Ah, oh, style! drunk and orbiting around myself. I found a seed, a little seed, and its name was hate. I buried it in my mind and watered it with tears. No seed ever had a better gardener. And Harry? He's a bloody sellout, you know that. He's always worked for the police. He probably got Peter detained. Let's try that place for a drink. Hey, listen, how's it, Barita? Yeah, I know it's sad. It's been like that ever since old Dave lost his leg. Yeah, yeah, I know. And then a wretch has to go and gap it down south. Listen, yeah, there's no way I'm going to leave this place, eh? No way. Hey, hold on. Thanks, man. Philip was one of my rare friends. But by then, he had one foot in the mire of white money and was fast sinking from view. Okay, so how's about uh, Friday, eh? Yeah, now listen, we must try and get there before dark. Yeah, Rick says they got six tours there just last week. <laughs> yeah, okay. See you about three o'clock then, eh? Cheers, my mate. Careful around the back, eh? Nothing to make you glad, or a human being. There's just dirt, shit, and blood. There's just bloody whites and dogs trained to bite us. There's white shit in our history, and white shit on our hands, and in anything we do. Full of people in the tea boy.
Even if that was okay, they still sell out and informers, stack up students and get rich fast bastards. Just as bad. Just as bad as white shit. They've all got designs, like you and me. What else do we do? Clash and drown each other? And if we don't do ourselves improperly, there's missionaries, cops, soldiers, Germany, the USA, France and the bloody British. Remember him? Edmund. At school, we had always despised him because he refused to have anything to do with our student armchair politics. He had been utterly lonely. Who would have expected that of Edmund? I would have. Hello? Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, that can be great. This office. This was what my mother had always wanted me yeah, to become. Okay. There are flies squashed to the memory. An iron net had been thrown over the skies, quietly. And beneath it, our minds festered. We were whores, eaten to the core by the syphilis of the white man's coming, screaming abuse at a solitary but defined racist, bearing our ass to the yawning pit latrine, writing angry black poetry. Ah, heroes, black heroes. Patricia disappeared from the university. They said she was roaming through Africa. She came back half blind, feverish, with her voice gone. She was in hospital for weeks, and they wouldn't let me see her because it was a whites-only hospital. They managed to save her sight, but she would never be able to talk again. All this happened after an encounter with some white students. Segregation is on disintegration. White segregation. Assholes. God, I hate this place. Gotta get away. Let's both get away from here. And go where? Do what? It's uh, easy. Uh, we just walk off campus and never come back. And just keep on trying to get out of this bloody country. We'll go to Botswana and fly to London. Just got to get away. Bitch. Oh! Come on, run!
Yeah, let's leave this shit. Yeah, I'll piss off. Another one of them. Communist? Ah, terrorist. Says he's a student at the university. Ah, take him down to 102. fucking can for five minutes and they'll talk like never never just five minutes now i won't bother asking you questions you know what you want so no start naming names now i'm waiting kicking me tore through the faded cloth of my sanity, scattering the skeletons of my childhood. My earliest memory is of the skies swinging askew. were clear and this made me trust it. I felt that dog in me keenly. It was the house of hunger that first made me discontented with things. I knew my father only as someone who was always out of work, occasionally fucked my mother and beat me up. I hardly saw him. But the old man was my friend. He simply came into the house one day, out of the rain, and stayed. Ah. 
This was Salisbury. Now it is Harare. Until 1936, black people were not allowed to walk on the pavement. Now they own the streets. Soon after arriving, we'd found ourselves in the middle of this demonstration in support of ZANU, the ruling party. This political ferment came out of a violent past. 15 years of struggle, 30,000 killed, one and a half million uprooted. Yet the feeling in the streets that day was joyful, unaggressive and affirmative. Come on. 
But the heart and identity of Zimbabwe lie in the country, so we left the city and headed east. It was here that the war was fought, and now the struggle for development turns on the issue of land for the people, for the peasants who were exiled in their own country. Rekai Tangwena, who played the part of the old man, is himself a symbol of the struggle for the land. As the old man, he told a prophetic story of the central character's alienation and exile. A traditional chief, he fought the Smith government for 11 years before he too was forced into exile in 1975 when he helped Mugabe escape over the mountains into Mozambique. <laughs> Today his fight against neo-colonialism continues even to the point of refusing to speak English. Tangwena's struggle to reclaim his heritage did not end with victory in the war. To resettle his people, the government had to buy back their land from white landowners. And as a result, there is no money left for development. <laughs> to overcome this, the government is encouraging cooperative production. Mm. 
Wabambo wanga wane fini. Ashe tenu tulo. Shundi kuita fini. Kutulo tuwane fini. Shina asi ini ni fungwa zangu. Ndine sori na simisi akatora ngombe zangu. Isho akatora ngombe zacho zwa shitu ngombe wadi mugabe. Mugabe akar wanenele. Hana kuru wanene. Ndika uraya munu inini. Nde uraya munu. Ndine ndine mosha. Shina nopa mosha mugabe uduunzi badara ngombe. Ine doa disimisi ya badara ngombe zangu. 473. Mambo kasi uno fara erendi so disimi saro sa akeng ngombe zangu mukaka andi shawoni merik kurima nda kuta mbutika nda kurima ngoma ngge mawo Tangwena is expressing the basic contradiction in Zimbabwe that political power has not yet been translated into economic power and until it is, colonialism has only taken a new form and still determines the shape of the society. And it's to this that Marachero is returning. It was 6 a.m. at Harare Airport and we were waiting for Marachero to appear. It was a relief to see him step onto the tarmac He was late, we'd been waiting for three days, and I was anxious about how he was feeling. There had been a delay in issuing his travel document to the High Commission in London, and this had triggered an extreme reaction, relayed in fought phone calls. He thought there was a plot of some kind against him. He'd torn up his airline ticket and refused to leave. Then the travel document was issued, and he'd decided to come. Is customs over there? Coming so high. Great. <laughs> Um, yeah. Oh my God! Kinda. Son of the soil. Kinda. You're noble. <laughs> hey, writer. <laughs> this is really good. Yeah. You know, I've just arrived actually. Yeah. Oh God. <laughs> Chris, how are you? Fine. I'm afraid um, um, uh, we had um, a bit of a uh, uh, hassle in London, um, um, but uh, I'm here anyway. And frankly, I think... Uh... Wilson Katio, also a writer, whom Marachera had known in exile. Oh, I don't know. This is Zimbabwe, for God's sake. Hey, look. I'm back home. <laughs> and uh, Zimbabwe Airport. I'm, I'm really back home. I... Oh, <laughs> right, shit. Hey, look. <laughs> The first time in eight years. In eight years. Yeah, thanks. Oh, the back one. Yeah, good. I was just kidding. It's my duty free goods. Okay. Um, and, uh, hey, look. It's really great to be in Zimbabwe. God. Uh, he was not going to come down here. I was simply fed up. I thought that you had set me up. What do you mean? Well, simply that um, um, you had really set me up to get arrested um, uh, here in Zimbabwe because I was going to have to travel without a passport. Like I was arrested in West Berlin. And, um, I mean, that's the sort of thing I was thinking, uh, you know, up there. Because, you see, you and Ron could have taken care of uh, um, all the um, um, uh, passport and travel document things. No, that was the problem yeah, for yeah. me. This is, this is all strange to me, actually. I'm sorry. I'm looking at all this as a bloody tourist. I can feel it inside myself. I'm looking at it as a bloody tourist. Not as part of my people. No, I can't stay. Do you know? I can see it myself. I, I, I don't belong here anymore. Do you know? 
I've come. Do you know, I was sort of, uh, I was sort of crying actually when I was making a, I was tape recording um well, something. Um, I've got this tiny cassette, and uh, tape recording um uh, the takeoff from Gatwick and um, uh, talking about my life in London, and really sort of um, trying to summarize it because um, I don't think I'll be allowed back. This is the only Zimbabwe I've seen so far, and frankly, the not Zimbabwe I want to get back to. Look, I come from uh, slums. That made it feel like uh, some sort of white guy who's got everything in his pocket. It's like somebody was painting with white plastic paint on my face. That morning at breakfast, Marachera learned from Katio that his second novel had been banned in Zimbabwe. Immediately, he went to the home of Musa Zumunya, a poet who teaches literature at the university. Zumunya had lodged an appeal against the banning of the novel. He explained the problems of censorship that persist in Zimbabwe, but he felt the banning could be overturned by the appeal. Contradictory. Yes. Juxtaposed feelings of violence and calm, yes. Yes. all those feelings of the past. Katiyu was also there. He tried to explain the political context in which they worked as writers. I mean, um, the, um, the, I've just arrived, for God's sake, and the, the first welcome I get is the news that I'm, I'm a, my book, Black Sunlight, has been banned uh, for being obscene. And um, of course, I know that uh, in the book there are explicit. Um, uh, sexual, uh, What's most uh, infuriating this is the censorship board is a peculiar institution at the moment because they made the decision because they were appointed to make decisions of that nature. The censorship board. The censorship <laughs> board. You know what Nambuzo is. I mean, is pointing out is that do I understand it that uh, here we are post independence. You know, during the Smith regime, it was all right to have this kind of institution with these kind of people, because they were part of what we are fighting. Now, after independence, they are still there. Mm -hmm. Well, my, my reaction to that is simply that, um, you know, there has not been a, um, any pressure from the um, um, Zimbabwean writers. You know, well, there's something wrong somewhere. See, if um, we are supposed to write in the sort of Jane Austen manner, uh, <laughs> good God, how can you equate, um, 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 revolutionary feeling with, as it were, a reactionary literature. Um, uh, good God, uh, what I'm saying is that why did they ban the bloody thing? I mean, um, look, we, we really have a number of problems, but I think unless writers become you, a, a, you know, a sort of uni, uni At the same time, though, if I may say so, I, I know this may sound like rather um, um, impractical criticism, but, um, uh, well, I don't know, you were telling me um, 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 when you met me at the airport at some point, uh, um, um, if, if, if that um, you have joined the Minister of Information, mm -hmm. and uh, you've joined the university. I mean, you are now teaching. That's you also right. write poems. Yes. You are now, as it were, a civil servant. Yeah, but oh, I, I mean, what's happening to us? We are all becoming bureaucrats. We are not becoming bureaucrats because there's never been, you know, wait a minute. We're, we, our generation has got a lot of problems. There's never been a tradition of us writing whereby people just sit and be able to live and write. In any case, you know that from anyway, anyway. No, 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 my point is mainly that... Uh, the point is now we're trying to earn our living and right at the same time. Yes, but, you see, um, um, points of principles <laughs> cannot be given up just because one has got to eat. Not, I don't see which principle I've given at all by simply getting a job. Frankly, writers have always um, put first their creative instinct, their writing, their... You are a poet. They are poetry. You are a novelist. They are novels first, before any sense of conformity with whatever system is going on. Look, let me come back to this. Are you here just for this film, or are you here to see if you can settle back at home? Well, frankly, I see myself, frankly, as being totally rootless. I, uh, for instance, uh, I've come down here without a passport, and um, yeah. I've always tried to move around without any passports. You are here? Well, I'm squatting in London. Okay, but you're here now, you know. Well, I mean, okay, you're staying in a hotel for the moment, but if you were to stay here longer, what would you do? Oh, uh, frankly, um, uh, I think I'll get out I mean, of Zimbabwe you know, as soon as I can. Why, because, because you, I mean, are you suggesting then that all writers get out of Zimbabwe or what? 
Or the Zimbabwean writers should leave outside there. No, you see, w what I want to do actually is to travel all over independent Africa. Because, you see, I've never been in independent Africa at all. Well, without a passport, do you think you'll make it? Oh, I'm applying for one. You see, the major problem in Lambuza is, in fact, here so far, two years of independence, you know, we, yes, I think it's disgusting that the censorship board, of the, which belongs to Ian Smith, is still with us today. And I think we, as writers, yeah. ought to do something about it positively. I also think, you know, the, is it, if it's the Literature Bureau ought to be something that serves the people of this country, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, these things we have to fight for, you know, rather than running away from the situation. My point is simply this. You would say, am I going back? to England. Mm -hmm. Frankly, at this point, actually, I don't really know myself. I mean, one moment I feel that I'm, 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 I'm going to leave. And um, the, uh, the next time I contradict myself and yeah. uh, say so, that I'm going to stay. I mean, I don't really want to sort of hard and fast things. answer. You see, what yeah. I was trying to do is to look at the possibility of if yeah. you haven't, if you thought you might like to stay, yeah. how are you going to eat? What are you going to eat? Where are you going to stay? Where are you going to get the money to do that? Well, I'm used to survival. I'm used to sitting in the streets. I, uh, I'm used to, uh, well, rough, uh, well, roughing it up and uh, yet continuing with my work. Mm. Um, um... Maracera went back to the hotel. I was already worried. I'd expected his return to be traumatic for him, but I hadn't anticipated his dismissal of the country within hours of arriving. I could understand his outrage at the banning of his book, yet he appeared to see it not as a battle to be fought, but as a reason to get out of the country as soon as possible. By the following day, the tension had escalated. He was drinking heavily, he'd insulted a Zimbabwean member of the crew, and was threatening to take the next plane back to London. He was giving interviews to the local press, and I was disturbed that he was already being depicted as the outrageous critic, the alienated outsider, a role that he'd left England to escape. I'm feeling very anxious about it, the way things are going. My feeling is that what you gave me to believe in London was your intention behind coming home. It doesn't seem to be coming out. Chris, Take I the don't attitude. think we're home here. No, 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 okay. No, we'll, we'll, we can argue about that term. But what I'm saying is that the intention of returning... I don't even know where different. my family is, Chris. You know that. Of course. That's part yeah, of the Yeah, I'm saying in a hotel with, which you have booked me into. Yes, exactly. In order to facilitate your return, we wouldn't have made the film. We wouldn't have, wouldn't have put, uh, started on this project had it not been your intention to come back. I mean, it, you know, uh, had you not said, I wish to return, not whether or not it could be permanent or not is another matter entirely. I'm not Chris, saying that, of course, you can't commit yourself. Chris, you're forgetting one but thing. It, it makes a difference. Y you're forgetting one thing, Chris. I may, I may be seen sometimes as a, a successful writer, but I'm still black. And the black person who has gone through, as you know, tremendous hardships, not only as a child, but in my youth. And, um, good God, not only in this country, under Ian Smith, but in the United Kingdom. Before we started filming, actually, um, um, I was always saying to myself, after each evening we would uh, have a talk, actually, I would simply say to myself, good God, this guy, what kind of a trip is trying to lay on me? I mean, he's, he's a filmmaker, yes. I, I, well, as I told you, actually, I did check up on you quite a lot, actually. Um, uh, that's why. You know, when finally we, st we started filming, um, uh, I knew very well that even though he is th this guy, the f this film director, this filmmaker, even, if, even, even though you are South African, you know, that's, um, you are one of those South Africans whom South Africa has always hated. That's why I've always trusted you. Of course, w w we've had our, our arguments, um, um, but those are pure, the purely occupational uh, occupationally hazardous uh, moments um, in writing and I think in filmmaking. You, you're used to that. You said to me in London, your purpose of returning to Zimbabwe was to see if you could relate to the society, if you could find a place in it. You were pessimistic about the possibility... That, that was the treatment that you gave me, you showed me. That was based on uh, discussions with... Chris, you came, then you came with all these ideas to me you, you were living in, as it were, the high splendor of liberal London middle class uh, 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 I don't, I don't, um, artistic activity. Can you at least let no, me wait, finish wait, wait, the question? Wait, 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 wait. I want to make, I want to give an example of this. No, Chris, I want to you give an use example. people, Chris, and you know it. Within two hours of arriving, you were saying that you were going back to London. You were calling this Rhodesia, you said nothing had changed. Well, because you were, um, um, then because you had withheld information from me. And then your response to a guy who was working with us, Noel, who was a fighter with the Liberation Forces, was, was when you heard this to say, you were a guerrilla, you killed people? 
I've never been with somebody who killed people. I've and he took this to be critical. I've he never was, been he with was, people. He, I've he never been with people who killed people. A critical that, reaction. I'm a writer. I don't it was work either, with either very insensitive or deliberately provocative. Frankly, I think that um, you were saying that you don't uh, talk behind people's backs. Noel isn't here, and um, he can himself. Um, uh, if you like any answer to that, he can I'm give you that answer you. himself. I'm asking you why you said what you said. We were talking in Shona, and uh, you don't even know our language at all. Um, and, I uh, heard the words, they were spoken in English. I, I, I'm anyway, why, why don't you bring Noel here and so we can talk? No, why didn't you bring him today if you're going to raise the point? So Noel came in. And he confirmed that Marachera had in fact said these things to him, in English. But my anger at what I felt to be his evasions had blown any chance of getting through to him. Oh God, I've really been set up. Okay. I've got 30 more minutes left. We established that the incident we discussed concerning Noel was a reality, did in fact happen. I just want it to know your feelings. Happen. You set it up, he's right now your pick-a-nin, um, he's right now your servant, he's working for you. I you as a film director, you know, right now look at him, he's sitting there as, you know, just a childish sort of camera assistant. I'm holding that bloody, we're making a, uh, film. a clever board. We're making a film about your return to Zimbabwe, about what, that is part of the subject. Is this your the return? employment for an ex guerrilla? I'm sorry, I'm going. I've had enough. I you need an answer. If you don't answer, beginning in 30 minutes. I've got a 30. Oh, look. Listen, this is for real. I've got 30 bullshit. minutes to prepare my next interview. You. Do you know, Dumbutsu, I want to know That's for real. The people are worth filming. If you leave yeah, now, and if yeah. you refuse to sort this fuck, out, fuck you, Dumbutsu. I'm serious. Walk out now. That is it. And that was it. The sudden violence of the clash left me stunned and sickened. It had degenerated into personal fight, yet it represented much more. But he felt manipulated, and I felt betrayed. It seemed impossible for us to work together any longer. In the streets of Harare, I tried to recall my experience of Marachera in London, the months of talking, and the understanding I thought we'd reached. But it seemed that, transposed to Zimbabwe, his needs and my expectations would inevitably drive us apart. My feelings of personal responsibility for what had happened and the need to resolve it with him struggled with the commitment to complete the film. I talked to Wilson Cotillo. He too was a writer who'd been in exile, but he'd been home for two years. Working with us on the film, he'd seen what had happened with Marichero. It's very funny. <laughs> At some time I feel that he probably wouldn't have come if he hadn't come with him or if he hadn't organized it. And then you came. With, or rather, you brought him over. There's a sort of alienation. I think to some extent he wanted to come home, but he needed a sort of, not excuse, a reason, you know, something. It would have been too much to just say, I'm getting a plane ticket, I'm going home. Um, from my own experience, when I came back, I sort of, uh, the last three days were just excruciating, They're very, very painful, um, in the sense that I remembered the last things that I'd, I'd seen done before I left the country. And to try and visualize what might have changed, you know, it really, you know, wasn't very easy. I was never really quite sure. Even when I arrived at the airport, I was a sort of nervous wreck. I think, really, uh, if you had had to wait until the mood was used to being here, then you wouldn't have been, I mean, well, you would be making a different film from the one you tried to make. But working with Marachera again proved to be impossible. He had gone to the newspapers and the raw had become public. He was trying to get an injunction to stop the filming. He didn't succeed, but by now the breakdown was irrevocable. Six months later, he was still in Zimbabwe. The anger and bitterness on both sides were left unresolved. Yet my experience of him in London remains and so does the meaning and value of what he'd communicated to us.
For, for a writer, actually, paranoia doesn't exist. Because after all, fiction, the creation of imaginative worlds real enough to be quite concrete in the reader's mind can really make the writer in total sympathy with anyone with those kinds of psychological problems. You see, I can put it to you, home, home, you mentioned the word home to me, it means nothing. Uh, I, 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 I'm even the most m mundane, ordinary human relationships, which most people take for granted, I've never really had them. Uh, yeah. In that sense, actually, I can be accused of misanthropy, because frankly, I'm um, I've seen how tenuous human relationships are because they always never depend on who is there and who is not. But actual existing laws um, which, um, within which humans, um, well, that word relate. But there are no easy routes into a writer's inner life. And in the end, I and the film had become part of the alienating colonial culture that he both colluded with and fought against. I don't like what, um, what I've become. I don't want to talk about wearing my skeleton on the outside. I'd like to show my flesh for once. And if Zimbabweans are my flesh and my people, that's what I'm, I'm trying to get back to.